Hey, Stargazer, hello. Welcome back to Earth Sky. I'm Deborah Bird, and I'm here with a couple of friends of mine, Marcy Curran, Earth Sky's voice of the night sky here on YouTube, and John Goss, who is a former president of the Astronomical League in the US, and also nowadays, Earth Sky's master night sky chart maker. Hey, John. Okay, we are here to talk about meteors. The Leonid meteor shower is coming up and we're going to tell you when and how to watch it and also some of the science of this meteor shower and of meteors in general. And plus we'll share some tips on how you can take photos of meteors like this one from Earth Sky community member, James Reynolds in North Carolina. So Marcy, when should people watch this meteor shower? Yes, hi everyone. Uh, the Leonids is a morning meteor shower. So the best time to watch it is after midnight through dawn. Uh, it's best highest in the sky before dawn. Uh, you wanna look to the sunrise direction and overhead to watch for meteors everywhere. And the you hear often about a predicted date and remember that's a best guess. You know, uh, it's estimated to be the best at around 18 UTC on the 17th, which is 11 a.m. Central time on the 17th. So the best times to watch are gonna be late at night on the 16th through the morning of the 17th, as well as the next night, the late at night on the 17th through the morning of the 18th. And you wanna get out um, away from city lights, have a wide open area to watch the sky, and uh, you want to have it as dark as possible. You might see up to maybe 50 meteors per hour. Uh, what is great about this particular meteor shower right now is there's only a thin crescent moon in the morning sky, so it will not interfere with watching from meteors. And Yay. the lanterns are bright, they're swift. A lot of them are colorful and many of them leave trains. And that is after the meteor has zipped you'll see kind of a dusty trail left by from its path. So uh, check out our earthsky.org stargazing spots to see if there's a location near you to go out and um, observe the meteor shower. Yeah, so this link that we have up here on the page is to Earth Sky's best places to stargaze page. And that's a crowdsourced page where people have uh, told us their favorite places to go and watch meteors. So if you go to this link, and we also have this link in the post description, you will find a place near you that has a dark sky where you can watch a meteor shower. Uh, but before we go any further, why, why would you want to watch a meteor shower? Like what is so cool about it? <laughs> Well, I, I personally would like watching them for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, it is really neat seeing these streaks go overhead. And by the time you say, oh my, they're gone. I mean, it, and you can't really tell, predict when one is coming. So you got to keep keep your eyes peeled. But the other reason why I like, I like watching them is to realize what they are, that they are particles of dust in space coming to you. And you don't have to really go to them. You know, the earth collides with them and we get to see them. Uh, I think that's that's pretty remarkable in itself. I always love just watching them streak across the sky. They're just peaceful to watch for me. Oh, yeah, very much. <laughs> and, and when I say, by the time you say, oh, my, which is what everyone does, there's some cleaned up version of that, you know, phew, they're gone. That's true. Look, and I want to remind everybody that meteor watching is a lot like fishing, and that is you go and you hope you will catch something and you might catch something, but you never know what you're going to catch. Yeah. If you don't go fishing, you're not going to catch any fish. So that's right. And John, I forgot to talk about the radiant point. So Jeremiah, can we go back one? Oh, yes. The radiant. Yeah. Yeah. The radiant well, the, point. So the, what, what is the radiant point? Uh, from our point of view on the ground, it looks, the radiant point is a spot in the sky, which, the meteors seem to all come from. Of course, they don't all come at once, but if you trace them all back, they all seem to meet up in a certain spot. And for the Leonids, it's in the constellation Leo. And for those of you in the know, it's, it's right in the center of the sickle of the constellation of Leo. Um, so that's where they all come from. Cause that's, cause that's where the earth is headed in space when these things hit. And you don't have to know the constellation Leo 
to watch the meteor shower, right, Sean? No, and, and you, you hear about wh wh where to face to see the the, the the best meteors. In my opinion, on this uh, meteor shower, the, the best place to look is to fa face east or east or southeast and kind of look up at 45 degrees, and you'll see both short meteors and long meteors pass by. You're not really looking at the radiant, but uh, you, you still get a really good view of this of of the meteors as they fly by. And John is talking about facing east or southeast if you're in the northern hemisphere, right. but this is a meteor shower that can be seen from all of Earth. So really, you don't need to know where that radiant point is. What you do need to know is that this radiant, it doesn't rise until the middle of the night. Is that right, you guys? Yeah. It comes exactly. up around the middle of the night. And that's why meteor showers are best after midnight. So you yeah. want to wait until that radiant point gets in the sky. You don't need to see it or know, just know that it rises in the middle of the night. And that after that radiant point comes up, uh, you're going to see a lot more meteors than you would have seen in the early part of the evening. So after midnight is really best for this well, shower. Th th this year, um, bright planet Jupiter happens to be just west of the radiant. So if you can see Jupiter up there, you're kind of in the same general region of the sky as the radiant. And John, tell people how they can see Jupiter. Well, Jupiter's the brightest object up there, uh, except for the moon, but the moon isn't an issue this time. So don't worry about that. But the moon is not just the brightest, it's by far the brightest object you'll be able to see. It's uh, very, very beautiful. Yeah, and I got up in the middle of the night last night because we had a fantastic auroral display last night, which we are going to be coming back right after this live stream to talk about the auroras and show you guys some pictures. But I was up in the middle of the night looking outside to see if I could see auroras from my very southerly latitude, and I did not see any. But I did see Jupiter coming up over the horizon. So that was somewhere around the middle of the night. And if you can see that bright object coming up in the east, that's from all around the globe. You'll see that. You know it's time to watch meteors. Um, so let's see. Let us talk about Comet Temple Tuttle. Temple Tuttle. Uh, it's not really a well-known comet uh, among people who are not familiar with these things. You just don't hear hear much about it. It was discovered in the, uh, I think, 1860s. And when it was discovered, um, people started looking at its orbit, and they realized it was a 33-year orbit, very similar to the uh, ebb and flow of the peaks of the, Leonid, of the Leonid meteor shower. And they thought, well, geez, maybe there's a connection between Temple Tuttle and the Leonids. And the more they looked, the more they found, uh, yes, uh, the Leonid's, the Leonid meteor shower really is the debris strewn out across space from Comet Temple Tuttle. So that's what we're really seeing is the debris field of Temple Tuttle streak through our atmosphere, giving us really cool sights. And the uh, that's a that's a cool historical fact. But there's the Leonid's is one shower that is really famous for things that it's done in history. Uh, Marcy, can you tell us a little bit about the Leonids history? You bet, the Leonids actually have a very interesting history. Uh, a meteor storm is when you can see over a thousand meteors per hour. And historically, this is one of the most well-known meteor storms in history. 1833, the Leonids had a meteor storm that was over 100,000 meteors per hour. I mean, can you imagine seeing that? Uh, they no. say that well, people thought it, it looked like it was raining meteors. It was just that thick. Um, and as John mentioned, there seems to be a 33-year period where we hit this densest part of the meteor stream and you will see a meteor storm. So they've had um, another one in 1866 and 67. There was an outburst. Uh, one of the most recent famous ones was in 1966 when people reported um, it was brief, but they saw over a thousand meteors per hour. And then in 1999, they predicted we might see an outburst again. And there was a report of higher than average um, observations. And it also had kind of an outburst in 2001 and 2002. Uh, our next predicted time is going to be 2033, and then they predict a big one. You know, again, this is 
just theory, but they predict a big one in 2099. So it's historically famous for outbursts. Yeah, historically famous and future famous at the same time. Uh, but before we leave, yeah, before we leave history behind, let's go to that 1833 woodcut of the Leonids, because that was important for the science, wasn't it, John? Yeah, this woodcut really represents when the science of, of, of meteors, studying meteors, began uh, as a science, not just as not just as admiring uh, shooting stars cross, crossing your field of view. Um, in 1833, we had this of many thousands per hour, but there was a guy named uh, Denison Olmsted who looked at this and said I, he wanted to understand what was really going on. So he investigated the idea of the radiant, what that was all about about particles in space colliding with the earth, what that's all about. And because of that, we have slowly progressed in knowledge to what we currently have today, a pretty good understanding of what's going on with this. But this was the very beginning right here. Right. And um, we got a question. Let's go to the next slide, which is from our friend Joel Weatherly in Canada. Uh, while we answer this question from J.H., who says he saw or she saw a couple of shooting stars last night, and could it have been <laughs> some of the Leonids? Um, yeah, I'll vote yes. It uh, could I'll, have been. I'll tackle that. Yeah, as Debbie said, it very well could be. There's a certain class of meteor called a sporadic, which is kind of just a random encounter of a stray meteor in, or a meteoroid in space. Could have been that, but these uh, meteor showers really aren't exactly sharp peaks. Some of them are quite widely spread. They're very broad. It could be a couple of weeks, one side or the other. So, you know, if you were looking, if you had a picture of what you saw and you could trace it back to the constellation Leo, you'd probably say it was a Leonid. The, the right. Leonids are active from November 3rd to December 2nd. So it's very possible too. Yes. Okay, so Marcy, you are gonna tell us about how to take photos of meteors. So what have you got? Right. Um, today's smartphones, of course, have great cameras on them. So you can easily take pictures of meteors with a cell phone. However, the, you know, the difference between we've recently been all out taking pictures maybe of Comet Lemon and your cell phone, you find the comet, you know, put it to the sky. You can't do that with a meteor <laughs> because the, as soon as you see the meteor and you click the button on your camera or your cell phone, it's not going to capture it because it's probably gone. So you have to take timed exposures ahead of time. So it doesn't matter if you're using your cell phone, um, a point and shoot camera or even a DSLR. Uh, you need to be able to set it to record at least 10 or 20 seconds, uh, maybe even longer. You probably should use a tripod or a brace of some time because that'll give you a better the option. You can set your camera on manual. You want to have use a wide angle lens, uh, your aperture f2.8 or better, um, an f4 would probably work. That's just how much light gets in, into your lens. And you want to set it for anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds and just kind of point to the general area of the sky and just keep taking shots. A lot of your cameras have the option to like repeat like 10 exposures or 20 exposures. So your best bet is to, to just point it at the sky and just keep keep repeating photos and hopefully you'll get a great meteor shot like some of our samples here we got from our Earth Sky community photos. Yeah, let's look at another image. The next one is from Melissa Bryant in Georgia. Right. And that's a really bright meteor. It's really nice. And again, it, it, it's honestly luck. You know, you just have to keep pointing and taking shots and, and hopefully you'll catch one of these great meteor shots. Yes, and we see a bunch of these at the community photo page at Earth Sky. So um, yeah, give it a shot. I mean, uh, you know, <laughs> why are you laughing? <laughs> give it a shot. <laughs> uh, yeah. what, what I like about this picture is that uh, it shows the color of, of, of the meteor, of course, being kind of a blue-green there. But it also recognizes the star Sirius right there. And the only reason why I'm bringing that up is because this is really quite far from the radiant. So you don't have to look at the radiant to get it, uh, scenes like that. Uh, that looks really nice. And, and what a nice lot of flare. Oh, go ahead, Marcy. Uh, it's got a really nice flare on it, too. And that's the beauty of setting, like, 
being able to set your camera manual that you can take my exposures and more likely to catch something like this. Yes. Uh, and what a lot of people do, I think, with taking the meteor photos, the long exposures of meteor photos, is they just try to get something scenic in the foreground. And then they, they just aim toward that. And then they just go for the long exposures and hope that a meteor shoots through. Right. <laughs> Then they've got a nice picture. Uh, we got one more to show you, and that is from Earth Sky community member Kathy O'Donnell in South Dakota. You catch a shot like this, I, I would personally go out and buy a lotto ticket that day. <laughs> yeah, because, and notice she, she caught this under a street light, which right. is pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool. Bright it Oh, somebody's asking a question. When is it? Sorry, just tuning in. Marcy, tell us again, when is the shower? Right. The best time to watch is going to be after midnight on the 16th through the morning of the 17th, as well as this, the next night after midnight on the 17th through the morning of the 18th. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a dark sky and any time before dawn is going to be a great time to watch. Uh, and John, you've got some last tips for us, don't you? Oh, yeah. Um, this is one of those scenes which you want to try to increase your chances of enjoying it and seeing meteors. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, yes, you do want to uh, observe from a dark sky location, a dark location. And if you uh, want to get out and travel a little bit, look at earthsky.org uh, slash stargazing, and you will see a map of some good spots in the U.S., well, the world, uh, to do stargazing and meteor watching. But the uh, important things to know is what Marcy was just saying, the peak time. Of course, you got to know when it happens. Uh, you want that dark location. You want to make sure there's no moon in the sky. And this year, we are really lucky with that because the moon is a very slender, thin crescent that rises just before sunrise. That's not going to bother you at all. Um, you also want to dress warmly because this isn't a, a high heat generating activity. You're going to be lying down in the, in the, in the dark of the night. So make sure you're, you have a nice coat, hat. Uh, blanket, whatever, and uh, if you can, uh, lie back and just just look up. You don't need binoculars, uh, just just your unaided eye. Um, watch for at least an hour because these things don't happen every uh, just periodically. It's it's kind of random in a way. You might get bunched up. You might get none for ten minutes. So watch for at least an hour. And here's another tip, just to make everything so much better. Try to enjoy your experience with nature at night. When you're outside in the dark, in the middle of the night, you don't do that very often. So uh, see what it has to offer. I, I think you're going to enjoy the whole experience. That was Beautiful. my tips. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, that is all we have for today. I'm Deborah Bird. We got to get out of here because we have another stream <laughs> coming up in 10 minutes. And we will... Uh, uh, let me say first that I want to thank both my guests, Marcy Curran and John Goss, both veteran meteor watchers and stargazers, and both of the Earth Sky team. Thanks, you guys. Uh, if you appreciate hearing about night sky events from experts like these, please subscribe, like, and share. And don't go away because we are coming back at 1230 Central Standard Time or 1830 UTC. And again, that's just 10 minutes from now to talk about last night's amazing auroral display. Aurorers were seen last night as far south as Mexico. We have an expert, a heliophysicist coming in to tell us what happened, why we had such an amazing display. And we've got a great collection of photos to show you. We hope you'll join us. One Earth, one sky, Earth sky.